there's just like a nationwide uh, fascination with real estate, isn't there? And this this desire to own your mm. own house mm. or your own property, right? And and um, something like two thirds of the population live in property that they own versus one third live in rented accommodation. Uh, and there's almost, dare I say it, a bit of a stigma, uh, mm. a social stigma and, uh, behind mm. renting. But if you go to the really long established, um, say European economies, um, it's the other way around. Welcome to The Lowdown, Wellington's number one real estate podcast. We're at episode nine with my great friend Adam again, and we're here to talk about uh, the real estate market. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, buying versus renting and uh, and a little bit about the market. How are yep. you? Yep. Going good, Craig. How about yourself? I, 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 what do you think about this new uh, setup? We're now sitting in it's comfy good. chairs. I know. It's Relaxed. Been a little bit more comfortable for another 50-minute session, isn't it? Look at that. I've got my glasses <laughs> on for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, um, we're talking about renting versus buying, right? That's a big conversation. Mm. Um, just to get us started, maybe just you know 20 seconds on what's happening in the selling market right now. So if someone's in the market to buy, what are they likely to encounter in Wellington? Sure. Well, we'll obviously, we just come off three years of the worst property market probably, you know, since the 70s uh, with a drop of 25% in terms of property prices. Yeah. Uh, pro- prices in Wellington, if we're talking Wellington specific here, yep. uh, you know, we're below the long-term trend in terms of property prices. Yep. Uh, we know investment yields are at the highest they've been since probably the mid-2000s or something like that or early 2000s. So it really is a fascinating time and I think just generally the market is favouring uh, buyers over sellers. Mm-hmm. We have seen, because we have about 25% of the market from Tawa to Seatoon, that data that's flowing through the business now has become very valuable and we can actually kind of see now because we're at the coalface we get that data earlier than the statistics that you know a lot of the economists are looking at and we can already see although the amount of listings in spring hasn't risen perhaps as high as we were expecting uh, the the buyer activity, not yet not yet but the buyer activity has doubled i mean we were at an average of about three and a half people per uh, open home, yep. uh, say four months ago, now 6.8. So yep. so a doubling in, in buyer activity. So most likely we're past the bottom uh, mm-hmm. and I think, but generally speaking, prices are more affordable than they have been for a long time. Great time for, for first time buyers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so prices are down. That's mm-hmm. a great thing for the, the, the buyers. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're a net investor, that is. So first home buyer or upgrading yep. to, from a cheaper to a more expensive house, that's, yep. that's good for you. Um, but you're talking about the activity at open homes, for example, and the number of listings, the number of uh, offers being made too, we've, we've seen in the data, haven't Big we? Big increase. Um, but that's largely as a result of lower new supply volumes coming into the market over the winter months. Yeah, Would you agree? I, I agree with that. I think also though, uh, my suspicion is a bit of a gut feel, but looking at the data, it feels like there is the interest rate drop yes, yep. brought some new buyers out. Yep. So more buyers saying, hey, we're, we're with this next cycle, mate, you know, maybe next year is going to be a bit more competitive to buy, <coughs> so maybe we should get in now. That'd be from a, com- from a uh, confidence perspective, yes. but also from a practical ability to raise money perspective. True. Both of those things will be playing a role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, and so I, I find that quite kind of fascinating. So you've got on two sides, you've got, you know, sellers that were kind of holding off thinking maybe next next year will be better than this year. So that, that spring rush hasn't fired quite as much as we were expecting. Still yep. there, but yep. a little bit subdued. Yep. And you combine that slightly lower than expected supply with a slight increase in buyer activity and yep. you get a doubling in people at open homes. So, yeah. 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 so um, overall, good time to buy, very good time to buy, uh, a little more competitive than, say, three, six months ago. Yeah. So what about the rental market? I mean, if you're a renter today or if you're a, a, a person renting a property out from both perspectives, mm. what's going on in the rental market? Yeah, so we've seen a very interesting time in the rental market in Wellington in particular, it would seem. Uh, I mean, overall across the country, rents have been trending upwards. Um, in Wellington, we have seen on average uh, rents kind of stagnate or increasing way, way slower than they have been around the rest of the country. Meanwhile, incomes have been going up until sort of more recently, as you'd know. Um, but really interesting is that we've seen in this year, 2024, uh, going into winter time, we've had about twice the available supply of rental accommodation on Trade Me available for rent, um, as we saw uh, between about 2019 and 2022. So 2023, last year, we saw more supply um, and then in 2024, we started with more supply, but then it really ramped up as the year went on. 
perhaps got something to do with the fact that the real estate sales market was slow again. Right. It was 2023, you remember, it was quite yep. a firming market. Transactions were taking place a bit more easily, a bit more liquidity in the market. Um, after the election, as we came into 2024, got tougher again to sell. So perhaps a bunch of properties that weren't selling entering the rental market, combined with maybe the slowdown in the public sector labour market, a few consultants not, not getting renewed contracts, a few people losing their jobs, um, a lack of new hires, that sort of thing. So maybe some popula population drifting out of Wellington. Uh, I'm, I'm only and theorizing here. And perhaps a bunch of people not even, putting, not even trying to sell and just going, now's a terrible time to sell, I'm gonna, just going to rent it. It may be. You know, Maybe. If they're but, moving out of town. Roughly that. speaking, um, and we could put a graph on the screen if we, if we, if we wanted to, but roughly speaking, uh, supply around oh, over 1,600, in fact, approaching 1,700, at least as of a couple of weeks ago uh, in Wellington, versus what's normal uh, up to eight, about two eight years ago at about 800. Yeah. That's an yeah, huge, absolutely huge increase. phenomenal yeah, increase. So that's amount, the amount of houses that someone could rent to, just today could go on to trade me and have a lot, you're going to see 1,700 listings. Something of that order. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's a massive renter's market. Massive renter's of... market. And and again, that's for, for, for those, for people who are out there looking, I'm mm. sure it doesn't feel that way. Mm, mm. But that's what the data says. You know, I mean, someone out there looking, there's never going to be enough. There's never going to, it's, it's, there's never going to be a good enough quality. You know, that's a very, it's, that's a very um, popular um, mm. discussion, I suppose, mm. isn't it? The quality of rentals in Wellington and not enough of them and they're too expensive how and does, all that. How does that interplay? Because I know Wellington is, a, is a, being a university town mm. and the university students putting a lot of kind of pressure on the market in that sort of Jan, late Jan sort of Feb market. Yep. Uh, traditionally, that's always been the best time to rent a house if you're an investor. They always said, you know, try and get a fixed term between kind of Jan to Jan or Feb to Feb. Yep. How, how does that... What you're seeing now in terms of that 1700, how does that interplay with that Jan Feb uh, sort of pressure and what, 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 how does that, you know? Yeah, so, so the student numbers are down significantly mm. um, and, and they're staying in the halls is what I hear anecdotally. They're staying in the halls longer because there's capacity there. Um, and so that's um, far fewer students out in the rental pool, in the public rental pool, private rental so pool. So that didn't really say. have the same impact this year, say in Jan Feb this year, as it normally would. Would you? Would I mean, it's still a tightening yeah, around yeah. those times, um, but the seasonality is not nearly as extreme. Yeah. The other thing is that, of course, the new rules or the current rules are that um, you cannot, you have to offer a tenant the mm. choice between a fixed or a variable. Uh, or um, you know, a variable, yes. what do you call it, a periodic yes. tenancy. And can't, so yes, a can't. bunch of tenants are opting for a periodic tenancy when, yes. the, when the fixed term expires. And then if they want to leave in August, so that's all gonna, of a sudden so that's there are properties more. that are coming available in wintertime that, that or normally only would have come available in wow, January so, that, so that might be playing a, role, a little yeah, bit of a role yep, too. Yep. So interesting. And I mean, who wants to move out in winter? I mean, no, there's not going to be some huge increase in that, I don't think. That's not mm. going to be a major driving no. force. But yeah, sure, if some, I mean, I had... Um, well, it gives I, everyone flexibility though too, doesn't it? It gives the people sell it who decide to sell, yeah. you know, so, yeah. so, buy, so landlords and, and um, um, renters both then have flexibility, which could, could change slightly the, di the dynamic through the year though. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's always surprised me that that, that, that pressure that, that the... Uh, you know that the university students put on the on the rental market in that period, that Jan to Feb period. It's always surprised me that that puts so much pressure on total on properties that are completely yeah, not yeah. being rented to. It's all connected, isn't it? Yes, yeah, all connected. It's yeah, all connected. it's amazing. You know, yeah. you put pressure just the entire market, including the the executive properties and the you know family homes and that stuff. Even yeah. those become much easier to rent. You know, at, yeah. the, at those times. Yeah, but, and I guess it's just yeah. So I mean, we're do we're talking about. Um, Buying versus selling today, right? So someone's making a decision about should I buy, should I sell, and and uh, we were just talking before about before we uh, started recording that um, there seems there's just like a nationwide uh, fascination with real estate, isn't there? And this this desire to own your mm. own house mm. or your own property, right? And and um, something like two thirds of the population live in property that they own versus one third live in rented accommodation, uh, and there's almost dare I say it a bit of a stigma. Uh, mm. a social stigma and, uh, behind mm. renting. But if you go to the really long established, um, say, European economies, um, it's the other way around. Mm. Um, roughly two, in a lot of places, two thirds of the population rent and mm. one third own. There's no stigma around renting. It's normal, mm. it's, it's accepted. Um, and in fact, it's unusual, you know, mm. to, to be an owner. I mean, 
What 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 do you anything well, you want to fa- say about that, or well, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's fascinating. I, I think that you know it's the, it's the Kiwi dream. You know, you know, like how the American mm. dream is kind mm. of you know build, but you know start to have a startup and 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 become yeah, you know yeah, yeah. rich and wealthy and, <laughs> and you know whatever you know the American dream. And, I want and, to start and, Nvidia. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> and uh, whereas in New Zealand, you know, us, us humble Kiwis is uh, the the Kiwi dream is you know quarter acre section. Yep. You know, um, uh, maybe a batch somewhere and 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 a nice nice quiet life. You know, so. Yep. Which I think is much more humble. I kind of like that. I like that sort of colloquial difference. It, it, uh, I mean, may, maybe it's something to do with our our heritage, because of course uh, we're all pretty much most of us are immigrants, mm. um, going back a few generations, mm. and we've come here for a better life, mm. for the chance, perhaps, and part of that it was for the chance to own property, mm. own mm. some land, and and, and so on. But it's, is there anything inherently also, wrong with renting? And is there any, anything inherently better about owning? Well, I also think it's deeply human as well. I mean, there are mm. there is an aspect of nesting that is just you know, family, food, fire, shelter that is very, very, you know, comforting and very appealing and mm. we have strong desires just emotionally as, as humans to, towards this stuff and I think that's probably true everywhere. And and that's where I think, you know, there's a fascinating difference between renting and owning and that is that, you know, from my perspective, it should be a rational decision based on your personal circumstances. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think I've said this before, uh, but, you know, the house doesn't know that you own it, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so the house can't love you back. It can't love you back. So why should you fall in love with it? You know, and and actually from a lifestyle perspective, you know, there can be some real benefits to renting. You know, yeah. no, I mean, just you know, if something breaks, you don't have to. You don't have that little little uh, man's n- the n- niggle on your shoulder or the niggle in the back of your mind that got to fix that. Oh, I got to fix that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not it's not your problem. It's not your worry. It's not your asset. Yep. Uh, and and probably you just need to let the landlord know, and they'll fix it in their own time. You can just kind of you can relax. Mm-hmm. So there's mm-hmm. some real benefits to that from an uh, emotional perspective. Yeah. And. Uh, Flexibility, being able to move, do those things. So it's all stages and phases of life, isn't it, to some degree? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think again, you can you can compartmentalize, um, you know, rationality over the emotion of it, and and try and make pe- the best decisions that you can based on your pers- personal circumstances. Yeah, yeah. So you've talked about um, flexibility, but and when you say flexibility, you mean the ability to. I, I just want to move. Mm. Right, I want I want to move house or I want to move town, that sort of thing. So you've got much more ability to do that if you're renting. Yeah, um, I mean, what else are some of the benefits? Um, I mean, everyone, I, I suppose, it's common to talk about the benefits of home ownership. That sort of thing is is bandied around and and, and reported on and talked about an awful lot mm. as part of this national fascination. Mm. But what what are some of the benefits that you see in in actually being a renter mm. instead of being an owner. Well, a huge one is not getting caught up in the in the in the you know the Joneses, the you know wanting to keep up with the Joneses, or you know um, and have the flashiest kitchen and spend a whole heap of money just making everything look amazing. That could be a con for someone who wants to do that. Mm-hmm. If you know if your desire mm-hmm. is that you know strong desires to do that, then do it. But one thing about renting is you can't renovate it, so you don't, and therefore you're not wasting money on that kind of thing. Uh, and and I think um, being able to try suburbs. I mean, my, my wife and I rented we've rented in many suburbs around Wellington when we were younger, and I did mm-hmm. too before I. I even before I met her, and it's great. You get to, you know, we just experiment. In, yeah, you get to experiment. You get to find out what you like, what you enjoy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think there's there's huge benefits, and obviously, you know, the housing stock is getting better, isn't it? I mean, there's regulation now, which means yeah, that true. You know, because yeah. Wellington did. If, if we're frank, Wellington did have issues with. The, the quality of the rental supply. Well, I think, I think Wellington still has a reputation mm. um, uh, for poor rental quality, mm. um, supply, you know, poor rental standards. But I mean, it's, it's got to be improving. Definitely. What do you think about the uh, about the co- you know the the sort of studies that show you know the correlation between home ownership and kind of better outcomes in life with um, health and all those sorts of things? Do you? I mean, I, my, my gut tells tells me there's a uh, correlation, is not causation uh, thing going on there, but to some degree. But yeah, sure, sure. Um, uh, gosh, I'm I'm I haven't dug I haven't dug into that, mm. and I'm I'm not a scientist, but um, uh, really, you, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, <laughs> I did did a, I did do a BSc, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose yeah. people would think of maybe yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe you're, a scientist. No, you're, you're a real estate agent. I'm a real estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. where's, my, where's my lab coat? But, <laughs> but um, yeah, obviously there's a difference mm. between, as you say, between causality and and um, and correlation, right? So, oh blimey, I feel like I could get into trouble if I <laughs> if I dive down this well, rabbit hole. Well, let me give you uh, just a speculation because I don't know either. But 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 my speculation is that there'll be some some truth to it. There'll be some, no doubt. you know, be an element of the fact that you will, know, it, will it be wholly responsible? 
Absolutely, absolutely not. not. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Um, and and so you know, um, I think home ownership is is a good thing to aspire to, but not at the expense of things like productivity. You know, GDP growth. You know, investing in productive assets. I think if we could shift the uh, the financial literacy of young people, I saw an amazing thing actually this morning. Uh, you know, uh, there's a, there's a um, guy, uh, I think it's Brad Gerstner, I think uh, is his name, in the States who's who come up with this concept uh, of uh, if, if the US government was to give $1,000 to every single uh, child born in, in the US at the time of birth mm -hmm. and put it into an index fund mm -hmm. and they couldn't touch it. But, you know, obviously we've got KiwiSaver, which is fantastic. Um, but but if they do, were to do that, put $1,000 in that to every single uh, uh, child born, it, was, it would only be, I think I think he said it would be uh, $2.7 billion. That's not even a weapon system that they're, they're building for, for wars over there, right? It's mm -hmm. a tiny drop in the ocean in terms of the money the US government is spending, tiny. Mm -hmm. And yet the- 2.7 billion. Per annum, per month. Uh, well, I think it was per year. It must be. Yeah. It must be every year. But but the point is that um, uh, that that would that would you could then you know you put a cap on on when they can take it out, and then you have monthly statements so they can see that growing, and they can be learning. There can be you know learning around compounding, mm -hmm. around business, around investment, and and around financial lit literacy, which can really help both both boost the economy and boost outcomes because. We are we are living in an era where you know um, forty percent of the of the U.S. population doesn't believe in capitalism, and that's that's a that's a that's a that's a country that is uh, you know when we we're talking about the American dream before, you know, and that, almost and, founded capitalism, and that's that's because people well, are looking. History, anyway. there's, there's a view that it, it's the the elites is a certain the elites are, have got the capital and that they're they're mm. getting ahead of everyone else and everyone else is left behind. Mm. And, and so was there a, was there a number that it would turn into? That's what you were. Was that one of the punchlines? Not really. Lines? Well, not really. I mean, obviously, oh. compounding would would, would take, take it to a big number. Well, it wasn't. I didn't. I mean, I'm sure there's more out there. I literally yeah. just just watch yeah. this for yeah. for five minutes. But the point yeah. I'm making is that kind of financial literacy from a young age about about uh, productive assets could see you know uh, people compound wealth from a younger age have mm. more focus on productive assets. It's really good for the economy, I and mean, that's what creates jobs. Mm. That's what mm -hmm. creates you know um, better lifestyles for everybody. I and mean, that's why over the last hundred. Years. So, so, so someone could um, be a, be a tenant for life, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. No, I, I agree with that. But wouldn't but but also, would home ownership would become more in reach if people were willing to think about it that way? Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. irony of it, mm -hmm. you know. And that, I guess that's my point: is that is that yes, you can be more comfortable renting if that if you you know see that as being a viable option, and you then then and then the irony is if you, you can actually compound your wealth from a young age and actually think about, you know, that, then you're far more likely to end up, uh, you know, with a situation where home ownership is only a small part of, of your overall net worth and you may decide to do that at some point in, the, in, mm -hmm. in, in life. Mm. Um, but without it, it, it cap, capping what you can achieve. And I think that's what home ownership too early, too young, at too high a price with with a long term high mm. interest rate. Because it ends up sucking a lot of your cash flow out of your yeah, out of the system. Yeah, renovating them and doing all that, getting tied into this. And I mean, on that... Um, surely one of the other benefits or one of the main benefits that, again, people don't talk about this, mm. I don't think, at least, it's not in the public media, it's not in the popular narrative, is that renting is way cheaper. Mm. Renting is way cheaper than owning, mm. at least in the first decade or something like that, you know. Um, and so that, that has to be. But that's... That's not out there in the in the in the public narrative. No, that's and, right. And the it's cheaper to rent for sure. Yeah. Way cheaper. Way cheaper. Yeah. Wait, we've sort of talked about that, so we, let's not go. Mm. In, let's not talk about rent vesting again. Mm. But <laughs> yes, that's right. And um, and so, what about you know um, in terms of just control? I mean, obviously that, that 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 I suppose we've sort of talked about it, but in terms of having control over the property, I mean that's one benefit. Yeah, I mean you do have control over your property, don't you? If you own it, I mean um, there is more ability now to have some control mm -hmm. uh, with the tenants rule, tenancy rules. Like you, I think the you, you you have to be able to reasonably be given permission to keep a pet, mm -hmm. um, although the the owner has the the um, ability to request more bond, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, to present, pre prevent against damage um, uh, and also make minor repairs like um, or minor alterations like paint, uh, put pictures up, that sort of thing. So sure, you, you, you get a... Um, you pay a little bit of a price if you're renting versus owning in terms of giving up some control, um, but you get flexibility, mm. don't you? Mm. Like you said. You, mm. So there's, there's always two, there's two edges to every sword, isn't there? Um, yeah, I mean, anything else? What else? What else is on our magic list here, Craig? 
So what, in terms of, um, of buying, what about upfront costs like um, uh, and ongoing expenses? What do you think about that? The, just the economics of buying. Yeah, I mean, and, and like we've talked, we just touched on it before that um, definitely buying, uh, owning is more expensive. I mean, as a tenant, do you pay rates? Mm-hmm. I mean, we've just had a 21% increase in our rates or something like that in, in Wellington. No rates, no insurance, no interest cost, no maintenance cost, I mean, what's, no what's, desire to upgrade What's the it? rates bill and the insurance bill for an average home? Yeah. If a home is worth, let's just say, a million dollars, what's the rates and insurance going to be on that? What do you reckon? What's your guess? It's probably 20K, isn't it? Oh, rates and insurance? 15. Wow, I reckon it's uh, I reckon it's 10. I reckon it's 10 to 12. We can do a little uh, – we'll do a little check on that and we'll pop it up on the screen, eh? Mm. Um, but anyway, even if it's only 10, that's the smallest of the numbers mm. we've just bounced around. Mm. That's $200 a week. Mm. And that, that adds up over, over time for sure. I mean, insurance and rates, they've been absolutely skyrocketing. And there's, um, there's real risk out there in terms of, um, you know, insurers being more granular and, and, and risk-based, risk-based pricing and, um, you know, the, the, the tidal areas, the, the floodplain areas and all that sort of thing. Um, there's, there's risk too, I suppose. If you own and you have a lot of your – you have all your capital or all your eggs in one basket, if you like, which is mo- what mm. most people do if they own a house, um, and, and you happen to be one of the unlucky ones that all of a sudden um, is on the negative side of, of a rule change and they – the council does a new flood mapping and all of a sudden yeah. you're in a Houses flood Houses are plane. a lot more complex and a lot riskier than people realise as well, aren't they? I mean, we've, we've well, well, I think know. they're a lot more complex than than they were 20 years ago, mm-hmm. even, you know? Yeah. And a, I mean, a good example of that is apartments, right? I mean, I mean, obviously apartments can be more affordable than houses, but we've seen all sorts of, all sorts of uh, carnage, uh, so to speak, in the, mm. in the apartment market, haven't we? So mm. what, what would your take on that be? If, if someone was looking at getting into the market, what would you say to them if they were looking at buying an apartment? It was more affordable? Uh, I, I would say don't discount it. Um, there is a lot of, I think there's a lot of fear out there with um, apartments with regards to body corporate, but a lot of it is just a lack of education. Mm. Um, you, again, you go to long established economies in, in Europe, mm. it's mm. absolutely the norm mm. to live in an apartment. Mm. Is it possible to live in an apartment and things go well? Totally it is. Mm. Um, and so uh, partly I think it's just a very young kind of industry here in, in New Zealand. I mean, how long has it been, mm. how, how long has it been um, quite popular to have apartments or how long have apartments really been um, coming up and being built in Wellington en masse? Well, there's been waves of booms since probably the two thousand mid-2000s, yeah. I think, isn't there? Yeah. But we're talking 20 years. Mm. Mm. You know, that's, 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 I mean, houses have been built in Wellington for 150 years. Mm-hmm. Um, so apartments are relatively recent. And so it's just a new, Industry and so anything that's in terms new of, takes a time of for it to large, normalize. In terms of large scale inner city apartments, I think they're yeah. relatively new. But there's, yeah. I mean, you know, the, 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 the suburban apartment complex, company share, you know, like that sort of stuff's been around for a long time. Yes, there have been some of them like from the 50s, 60s, that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think if, if you end up with a bad one, if you end up with a, uh, a building that's got issues, or even a body corporate committee mm. that doesn't know what they're doing. Mm then that's a real liability. So we, so we talked about ongoing costs and we, you know, I, I, I probably overestimated there before, but thinking about apartments, there wouldn't be an overestimation at all in an apartment because, uh, you know, your, your uh, rent and insurance now, uh, sorry, your, um, your body corporate fees and your insurance. Yep, are and your insurance be... covered by your body corporate. And yeah, your body exactly. corporate also is responsible for basically for maintenance of the exterior shell and the structure of the building. Yep. So that's your roof, your cladding, your exterior joinery, your foundations, your grounds, this sort of thing. And so just yesterday actually I was speaking to a client who, who is an investor who has, who has t- traditionally bought freestanding, um, fee simple properties in city fringe locations. He's completely over it. All of the maintenance, all of the costs involved and the hassle of constantly staying on top of the repairs and so on. He's got a couple of... Uh, smaller apartments in kind of 1970s concrete um, blocks in the suburbs, low-rise things. And he said, look, the returns, the cash flow from them is not as great because the the purchase price versus the rent, that equation doesn't look quite as good. But it's just it's, he's just so over the headaches. And so mm-hmm. he's he is wanting to sell his um, traditional properties and buy more suburban 
you know, small suburban flats with mm. professional couples as tenants. Yeah, so well, that's on. interesting. And those, those sort of blocks may be able to manage costs, you know, quite well if they, mm. as you point out, if they're well managed. But uh, I mean, my experience has been there are huge risks in the apartment market for mm. first-time buyers because you know you can't control that decision making by committee. You end up often with you know really, really, you know, totally, yeah, totally. And, so, so if you have a a building that is sound mm. and you have a body corporate committee that is across their jobs and they are, they have appropriate skills in dealing with buildings and have good networks of professionals that can help resolve issues and mm. uh, keep maintenance going and all that sort of thing, then that's a real asset because the, that, that owner doesn't have to get quotes for the roof. But, it's but all often, done for you. But my experience has been that that often means high outgoings and the reason is because if it's well managed, and this is the, the irony of body corporate fees is mm. they can look cheap and that can be a false economy because yes. the best managed ones actually know they need a sinking fund. So you're constantly paying into that sinking fund above yep. and they need a good margin well above what their run rate of what they think the costs are going to be to manage that well and to have a margin of safety there. Yep, and so completely. actually, you know, uh, but, you know, buyers just look at the headline number, don't they? They look at like, it would be great to have a body corporate fee of 9,000. That one's got one of 24. Wouldn't touch that with a barge, barge pole. Yep. And obviously 24 is an extreme example, but they're out there. We've seen a lot of those sorts of the, those body corporate yep. fees that high. Yep. And so I think, you know, you... You do need skills to delve into ha to the past, the history of you know last three years of financials, minutes. Try and figure it out. Is a bit more of an involved process, isn't it? Doing due diligence. Well, on to that. see what you're getting for your money. Mm. I mean, if you've to use your example of twenty four thousand, mm. if if sixteen thousand of that is going towards the insurance, and there's only eight thousand left over to actually manage the maintenance of the building, then that is an issue. Um, but you're, you're right. You can't go too cheap, but you don't want to be ripped off either and, and have your money being wasted. So it, you got to strike a, a, a good balance, don't you? Um, and I always think that um, you, you're absolutely right. I think that most people, and there are always exceptions to a rule, but most buyers will look just look at the, the headline body corporate um, levies number and decide if it's too high or too low, rather than digging into it. Um, if you actually go into it and you see gosh, um, every year out of my body corporate levies, let's say 5,000 is going towards a long-term maintenance plan, then what you are buying into, and let's say the body corporate might have half a million dollars of cash mm. sitting in the bank. Mm. Um, and, and, and if there are 20 apartments in that building, you're effectively getting um, a fund of, let's say, $25,000, which is going towards your future maintenance. Mm. Now, when you buy a little bungalow, are you buying a bank account mm. to help cover your future maintenance? Mm. Absolutely, you are not or a team of people who uh, spend time and effort organising your future plan. Um, and so when the roof does um, blow up, uh, you don't have to raise another mortgage to pay for it. The money's sitting there. Mm. Um, and so again, it's it's way more complicated than a house, but I think it's, 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 it's too easy for people to automatically just assume that that money is dead money and you're getting nothing for it. It absolutely isn't the case. So, so yeah. those are the two biases we see, isn't it? We see the bias in the apartment market where people look at the headline number and, and, and just think that's that's the important one. And, and it's a waste and, of money. And, and it's then, a dead money but then doing e nothing. Equally on a, on a freehold home, we see people not really appreciating the level of maintenance that's going to be required. So that those are right. kind of the two things you see people yeah, do. Yeah. And people should, should think about those when buying. If you actually sat down and looked at a cost over 20 years of looking after your villa. Yeah. Before you've before you've even improved them, it's going to be high. The the roof, the the, the maintenance of the cladding, the painting, the grounds maintenance. Mm. It's hidden. It's a hidden. It's a hidden cost, but it's there. T totally. So, so if we were to, to think about some recommendations for people right now as we wrap up, I mean, one one thing I think, uh, you know, one thing I think is we're going to the next. This is this is a speculation on the future, right? Because mm. I think the next uh, building mm. cycle that we're going to have, we're going to see a lot more high density. Yes. You know, I think we're going to see a lot of like, you know, very small townhouses, apartments, but I think that's a really good thing, like a really good change because, and again, you mentioned, you know, places, I think this is way more common overseas, they're way ahead of us on this front. Mm. And I think there is something to be said for people looking at those as a good option, as a stepping stone. I think when you when, when, when buildings are brand new, they tend to have low fees because the buildings are brand new, so it takes a while for them to settle in. Obviously, those will rise over time and people have to factor that, but it's not bad to have, you know, five, 10 years of low, low fees. That's, You're that's talking a about good body thing. Corporate levies. Body yeah. corporate levies. Yeah. Because or indeed just general maintenance costs. Or general maintenance costs, which will be factored into those low fees. Sometimes mm. you can, you'll be able to buy freehold townhouses now with just a yep. with just a, um, residence, a association. residence association fee. Really good way to get into it with lower costs and you can be a Typically just covers your, your insurance yeah. and maybe maintenance of the pathways and stuff. So over the next few years, I think we're going to see some developers come out with some great product around that. And I think they'll be good good stepping stones for people even to buy off the plan as, as the market has, has come out of, of this kind of you know downward cycle. I think that's going to be great for first-time buyers. And, and so if we said, you know, we're really kind of saying that it's a renter's market 
and it's a buyer's market. Mm -hmm. And so, and, 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 yeah. and people should, you know, seriously think about renting for longer and, and, and doing more with their money in terms of their, of building long-term wealth, but equally great time to buy a house if you are in the market to buy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing I would say is that for a lot of people, um, uh, yes, it would make sense to rent and rent for longer and nothing wrong with that. Um, but, uh, you know, some people are not as disciplined as others. And so um, when that extra money is coming into their account, they're just spending it. Mm. It is just human nature to spend mm. every dollar we earn. So, you know, if you're like that and you know that um, having a forced savings scheme like a owning your own home, mm. then then that can be good for you. Uh, but I agree. There's nothing wrong with nothing wrong with renting, and I don't I don't see why there should be such mm. a stigma um, about renting. And and I suspect it will change over time um, as as our economy and as our society matures. Um, what, why would we be any different than than what's happened overseas and mm. in, in the in the in the other parts of the world so that are much older? So we need to, we're going to see higher quality rentals, rental renting for longer, and a higher density, smaller smaller properties, which will be more brand new as well. So we're less likely to have earthquake mm. issues and some of those things people have to navigate. And less stigma around being a renter. Yeah. yeah. Great conversation, mate. Awesome. Appreciate it. Good one. That Thanks was the lowdown. Uh, appreciate your time and please like and subscribe and we'll be back in to do it again next time. See you next time.